just the kind of atrocity, you know, atrocities that were committed um, by the United States. Um, on the people, but also in terms of sort of the guerrilla war tactics on the part of, of the Filipinos. So she says this, and I think it's important because you will also read her, but this particular gener General Jacob Smith, uh, she writes, fresh from his victories in northern Luzon and Panay, was chosen to lead the American mission of revenge. Smith's orders to his men embarking upon, upon the Samar campaign could not have been more explicit. So this is a quote from a General Smith who was in the Philippines. He says, kill and burn, kill and burn. The more you kill and the more you burn, the more you please me, right? The more you please me. And when he was asked about an age limit actually for killing, he said this quote, everything over 10, everything over 10. So Smith ordered uh, U.S. Uh, military forces in the Philippines to be turned into a howling wilderness, right? So that, quote, even the birds could not live there. Even the birds could not live there. This is significant because if you're going to try to understand why Filipinos, including Carlos Pulosan, immigrated to the United States, you need to understand this history, right? It's very vital to understanding that moment, the beginnings of sort of mass migration of the Philippines, uh, from the Philippines to the US, but also why we continue to be in the Philippines today. This is just some imagery. This is, uh, this is him, right? That's actually General Smith. That's a, that's a Cold 45. And this is actually, how many of you have been to Union Square in San Francisco to go shopping, you know? Or just to check it out, like as a tourist, you know, with your family when they come from the Philippines? Raise your hand. Union Square. Right? Next time you go to Union Square, I want you to pay attention to the big monument in the center of Union Square. Because actually this is a monument that was meant to commemorate the US colonization of the Philippines. Right? And it's like it's sort of, you know, look at how like what that image um, portrays, right? I mean what does that image kind of conjure up to you? What do you feel like that is supposed to represent? What? Hmm? Victory, yeah. In fact, I think that's the name of, of the monument, some kind of victory. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so, I'm going to keep it. Ah, oh, shoot, I keep doing that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll do better when I'm in class. <laughs> but, so indeed, the Philippines was very much left a howling wilderness. Um, those who survived, if you survived, were left without food, without water, without animals, without homes. Conditions were such that many, when they were later um, given the opportunity to do so, would emigrate from the Philippines to the US for employment. Because what was happening on the other side of the Pacific, so on, on the Philippine side of the Pacific, you have this war raging, right? The United States sort of asserting its a colonial might over the, the, over the Philippines. But on the other side of the Pacific, in the United States, the United States economy was growing. And it would require, particularly in agriculture, it was requiring more and more laborers, right, to produce for this expanding um, industries. So although agricultural employers had relied on low-wage workers from other Asian countries, including China and Japan, so what was happening is the United States was always sort of importing or relying on racialized labor for particular kinds of occupations, right? So the United States, for instance, had always relied on enslaved, Af enslaved Africans, right? In, in sort of the southern economies, also in agriculture. And after emancipation, after enslaved Africans were liberated, you know, to what extent they're actually liberated, that's a question, but were, were liberated from, from enslavement, uh, the United States then turned to other sources of labor to fill particular kinds of needs. So it went to China at first, and then it went to Japan, and then eventually went to the Philippines. So one thing, the reason why um, the Philippines became a source uh, for workers was because there was major kind of backlash against the, the importation of Chinese workers. They were considered a yellow peril, peril. So you see this image here, right? And what do you see here? What does that image seem to represent to you? Just look at the kind of figures if you can see what they are. What do you see on the, on the right? What is that dude? Somebody? Some white guy. What does he look like? Is he happy? Is that, what's he doing? 
He looks like he's sad, yeah. He looks like he's kind of like, you know, not happy. <laughs> so what, what, and what, does, what do we see here, like um, kind of on the left, what does that look like? Can you kind of see the image from where you are? What does it look like? Angry Asians, yeah, right? And sort of in lots of them, right? So there was this whole idea that there were these hordes of Asian workers who were going to come and take away jobs from white people, right? So they're considered, you see now, the yellow peril. And so actually, California was the site of some huge um, anti Chinese movement. <coughs> um, Leland Stanford, Stanford University, Leland Stanford actually was one of the big kind of champions of this anti Chinese campaign, actually. Um, and so eventually, China became cut off as a source uh, of workers for, for, uh, for various industries. Right? The, a series of Chinese exclusion acts were passed. So they were prevented from coming. Then after that, uh, the uh, employers thought, ah, oh, you know, well, we're going to look for some other Asians, you know, because we, can, we might be able to um, take advantage of that labor. So they went to Japan. And then in Japan, after a while, there was a similar kind of sentiment about, against the Japanese. And then another uh, act that excluded the Japanese was, was introduced, the Gentlemen's Agreement. So then now uh, they're really, really trying to hustle and trying to look for sources of work. Where do they go? They go, aha, we got those islands in the Pacific, the Philippines. And not only do we have them, those people are actually ours, meaning to say they're not considered foreigners, right? Because once a, a, a country colonizes another, Right? The people of the colonized country become considered the subjects of the colonizer. Right? So technically, under because the United States had colonized the Philippines, the Filipinos were now subjects of the United States and weren't considered foreigners, per se. Right? And so labor recruiters went to the Philippines very actively to recruit for workers. Now, were there workers to be had? Absolutely. Right? When we go back to the General Smith comment, did they turn the Philippines into a howling little furnace? They did. And so you had many, many people who were completely displaced and were desperate for some form of livelihood. And when those recruiters came knocking, and they actually had recruiters coming to villages, right, trying to, to, uh, to get people to come to the United States, you can bet that people went, and they did, right? And so um, by the 1930s, Right? More than 100,000 Filipinos would eventually make their way to the United States, like Carlos Bulosan. Now, what was farm labor like um, in, for Filipinos? So this is a lot of what the Filipino workers were doing. Right? And again, there's a reason why some of the towns that I mentioned um, continue to be Filipino uh, communities. Places like Vallejo, uh, Union City. Even when I was growing up, Union City still had farms, actually. <laughs> Um, where people, um, some of my Mexican um, classmates, actually their parents were still working on the farms in some of the canneries in the city up until really like the last maybe 20, uh, 15 years, I think, maybe when things started to change. Um, but there's a reason why Filipinos continue to come to those places, because previous generations of Filipinos were settling in those towns. So what was work like for Filipinos in these places? Carlos Bulusan writes about this in his book, he says, just describing, because he didn't only do this, and, and as you'll learn in the class, Filipinos sort of had to go up and down the West Coast sort of looking for seasonal labor. Because, you know, when you think about it, um, when, the, when, the, when, you know, farm labor ends at some point, right? There's planting, then after planting there's harvest, and then what, right? It sort of fields go fallow, or you kind of have to wait for the next season. So, he talks about this. So it was odd on the season for planting cauliflower. I went to the field at 6 in the morning and worked until 6 in the afternoon. It was tiresome, backbreaking work. I followed a wagon that carried cauliflower seedlings between the long furrows. I cooked up the seedlings with one hand and dug into the ground with the other. Then putting a seedling into the hole, I moved on and dug another hole. Hole. Um, I could hardly move when 6 o'clock came. I climbed in the way to the wagon that took me slowly into town. Sorry. But I think you get the point there about the kind of uh, work that Filipino workers were doing um, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, so uh, uh, not only were Filipinos working incredibly difficult, backbreaking jobs, they were also dealing with a lot of this racism by, by whites, uh, white Americans. Um, this is actually very interesting. This only happened very recently. I didn't even know. Literally just in September, the, um, 
I guess an official apology came from the city of Watsonville for some of the riots that were committed against Filipinos. So this is an article here. But like in the 1930s, you see here, there were hundreds of white men armed with pistols and clubs who were roaming the streets of Watsonville. How many of you know where Watsonville is? Raise your hand, right? You may have passed it. It's like off uh, 101, yeah? Not far from Santa Cruz, I think. Um, for five days in January 1930, Beating Filipino field workers and finally, um, in a shooting on San Juan Road, killing 22-year-old Furman Tobera. 22 years old. How many of you are 22? Or almost 22, right? I mean, this is around your age. And so this is a kind of context Filipino workers found themselves in. They work in these jobs, the only kind of jobs they can get. They're dealing with all sorts of races, and that even leads to all sorts of kind of racialized violence. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> there was also, part of the reason for the violence was actually Filipinos, and you guys are going to laugh at this, especially the dudes, um, because Filipinos were actually kind of considered a kind of cultural uh, and moral threat, partly because of the ways in which, because they were dating white women. <laughs> so, this is kind of funny. I mean, <laughs> so, one of, uh, there, was a, there was a California judge um, who had sort of made this comment about the Filipino man. So he's like, basing on my conclusions of year, on years of observation, I regret to say that there is probably no group in this city proportionate to its members that supplies us with more criminal business than the local Filipino colony. It is no compliment to the predominant race that most crimes committed by Filipinos have a background in intimate relations with white girls. Right? So there's this other sort of quote about uh, people in the text. So there was this, this notion um, and Filipino workers, many of who were kind of in bachelor societies, because of course agricultural labor was mainly male labor, right? That somehow not only were they going to take away white jobs, they were also going to take away white women, right? And so there was this all of this sort of fear, and that kind of provoked violence um, at certain moments against Filipinos. Um, by the 1960s, uh, Filipino workers' uh, employment conditions would change very little, and I'm going to talk about the 60s in a bit. But so basically, after all of this. Filipinos were then the target for also immigration um, restriction. So by 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act was actually introduced, which limited um, Filipino immigration to only 50 years. Okay, I'm getting bored. She's falling asleep. Let's let's let's, let's, let's move on. So it's not you. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> they couldn't know me. I just I don't feel sad. <laughs> but I'm gonna wake you up anyway because um, you should. Do you sing? Do you sing? <laughs> <laughs> so, by the 1960s, the Filipino workers' employment conditions had changed very little from the ways that um, uh, Bolosan described them. And this is where I think it becomes important. Right? Okay, so now I've just supplied you with all of this history. Yeah? And again, we, what, was, what did I start with when we started off at the very beginning? I wanted you to think about how to get from wake Right? Wake from a what? Noun. Noun to wake as a verb. verb right? Wake yeah. from, from wake as a noun to wake as a verb. Right? So by the 1960s, a lot of the children of these manos, right, and other successive ways of immigrants, began being very inspired by this heritage, uh, this history. Rather than keep watch, right, rather than just keep vigil or mourn, because right? that's one way you can think about this history. It's an incredibly tragic one, right? You see Filipinos working in backbreaking jobs, right? They're the target of all this racial violence, right? So much so that the United States says, we don't even want them anymore, right? Stops letting them come here. In fact, you know, Philippine independence, right? You know, the Philippines uh, got in, was in, uh, granted independence by the United States in 1946. Well, there's a connection. Basically, the United, States said, said, the United States said, well, if we give those folks independence and their, their own country, they become foreigners. And then when they become foreigners, then we can restrict their, their immigration, right? So then we can't have them come here anymore. But then we still came, and there are many mechanisms by which we came. But successive, sort of by the 60s, the children of the monos, right? Children of other waves of immigrants, again, rather than just sort of be passive, mourn the kind of conditions that Filipinos were living, were roused, right, were, aw were uh, awakened in an active sense, right? They connected to these experiences of racism and exploitation, to their experiences as young people of color, as people from struggling families. And so it was in um, this kind of connection, 
right? An active sense of wake in the 1960s that brought about the movements that led to Asian American studies and ultimately